Bochotabot ladies and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah sessions and whether you're logging on to Torah Anytime or to ohelsara.com or if you're a YouTube subscriber and follower we thank you so much for your dedication and your commitment to your neshama and to this channel and to our shiurim. Kadosh Baruch Hu should bless your journey. This shiur is dedicated oh first let me tell you where I am I'm in America and I'm so happy to be here in order to continue our good work and thank you so much for all those ladies that found out from the last week's shield that I'm here and you sent me all the emails welcoming me to the United States I truly appreciate it this shiur is going to be Be'ezat Hashem dedicated for the refuah shlema of Odette Bat Saida, she has a tremendous refuah bekarov mamash, and Igal ben Chana. Kadosh Baruch Hu should send them both a refuah shlema bekarov. She has health and prosperity. They have arichut yamim v'shanim tovim. She has health and happiness. So let us begin because we have some work to do today. This week's parasha is Vayera, which is famous for Akedat Yitzchak the binding of Yitzchak and Hara Moria. During the time of the Akedah, Yitzchak Alav Shalom was placed on the Mizbeach by Avraham Avinu. And the Pasuk says, Vayasem oto al ha-Mizbeach. And Avraham placed him on the altar, ha-Mizbeach. What does ha-Mizbeach, the Mizbeach, the altar mean? because it seems as if the Pasuk is referring to a very specific and famous altar. So Chachamim tell us that this Mizbeach was the same Mizbeach that Adam Rishon offered a sacrifice on after he committed the sin in Gan Eden. So at this point of the Akedah, Avraham Avinu returned to the same spot and he used the same Mizbeach. And the Zohar Kadosh states that it was now that Avraham Avinu was involved in rectifying the sin of Adam. Yitzchak was also involved in this tikkun, as well as his son Yaakov, alav shalom, and all his sons, the holy Shvatim. Everybody was involved in a tikkun olam, in a massive world rectification. You see, after Adam committed the sin and ate from the forbidden tree, so much trouble so much sorrow, havoc, and death came down to the world. So much of it that that sin and its consequence required a rectification to be made by numerous tzaddikim, by a multitude of righteous individuals. So Akedat Yitzchak was Avraham's part in rectifying the chet, the sin. Avraham goes back in time, so to speak, to a great historical moment of the beginning of the world, back to that same location. But how exactly was Avam rectifying the sin? Rav Pinchas Friedman Shalita in his Sefer Shvilei Pinchas asks, well what was the Chet of Adam Arishon? What was the sin of Adam? We all know what his sin was. He ate from the Etzadat, from the forbidden tree, that's it. Oh. Is that all he did? He ate from that sadat, that's it. I mean, describing Adam's sin in this way is like trying to summarize the entire solar system by singing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. I mean, you're taking the most complicated subject and describing it in the most simplest of terms. That Adam Rishon ate from the etz, that's it. It's not so simple. Adam Rishon was a creation of Hashem. He was the only man ever to be born in Gan Eden, and he was charged with only one mitzvah, as it states in Sefer Bereshit. From the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For the day that you eat of it, 
Mot tamut, you shall surely die. I want you to think about that for a moment. If Hashem spoke to you and commanded you not to eat from a specific tree, would you eat from it? Of course not. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Adam that he could eat from any tree that he wanted to, except for this specific tree, and he eats from it. There's no real way to understand this episode unless we turn to the holy Mekubalim, the Kabbalists. And we're going to turn to the Ariya Kadosh Alav HaShalom who teaches us that prior to the sin of Adam Rishon, the Yetzer Ara, the evil inclination, was not part of a person's psyche. The Yetzer Ara was not internalized within the individual. The Yetzer Ara existed as an external part of man. What does that mean? The Yetzer Ara existed outside of us, somewhere over there next to the tree, so to speak, rooted in the snake. So it was easier to serve Hashem. Why? Because all Adam had to do was avoid the Nachash, and then he wouldn't be faced with any temptation. Just don't go near the snake. It's not like today, where wherever you go and whatever you do, he's there with you. He's, he's not beside us. He's not outside of us, somewhere in the distance. He's inside of us. You can't check in the Yetzer Ara at the door. Today the Yetzer Ara is an intrinsic, an intrinsic part of us, and he's attached to the human being. Prior to the Chet of Adam Arishon, the Yetzer Ara was an external force. When something exists outside of you, it's easier to conquer and defeat it. It's also easier to serve Hashem in the sense that Bechirach of Sheet, free will, wasn't as we know it to be today. It was easier to choose right from wrong. So Adam thought, what's a more elevated way of serving God? To serve Him without being tested? Or to eat from the forbidden tree and have the Yetzer living inside of us? And in that way, we'll be subject to numerous challenges. Wouldn't man receive a greater reward for overcoming a greater challenge because he worked so hard to overcome? Ah, oh, it's a good point that Adam was making. So his Bechira, his free will, is elevated when he's faced with a more difficult challenge. That's why he decided to eat from the tree. And as a result of disobeying God and eating from the etzadat, the yetzerara became a part of man. The yetzerara penetrated man's psyche and became an internal part of us. And now all of a sudden, we have this inner battle that takes place. Are we gonna choose right from wrong? Are we gonna surrender ourselves to the will of Hashem? So yes, it is a greater Kiddush Hashem, a greater sanctification of God's name when the Yetzer is inside of us because we're now being attacked by the evil that resides within and, and if we conquer, that's a greater sanctification. Whereas if a person is pre-programmed to do good, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate genuine loyalty to Hashem. If I have a Yetzer Ara attempting to persuade me to reject what's right and embrace sin, but I still choose to do the will of Hashem, that's when I'm demonstrating my true colors. That's when I'm showing that I'm loyal to Hashem. So according to the Ariya Kadosh, Adam's plan when he agreed to eat from the tree was Although I'm going to be committing this minor sin, much good is going to come out of it. Because now I could serve Hashem on a higher level. Adam felt that he was justified in eating the forbidden fruit because in the long run, he'd be creating a greater Kiddush Hashem. What Kiddush Hashem? The fact that he's now utilizing his free will to do what's right and just in the eyes of Hashem rather than being pre-programmed to do his will. The problem is that Adam made a grave miscalculation and he erred. 
and for that reason he was punished. So now, 2,000 years later, Avram Avinu, Alava Shalom, came along to correct that sin. Avraham was directed by Hashem to the same spot where Adam offered his koban following his sin. Why was that so significant? Because in Avraham Avinu's case, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him to do something that didn't make any sense. God told him to take his beloved son Yitzhak and offer him up as a sacrificial uh, offering. Does that make any sense? Especially after God promised Avraham that through Yitzhak, Am Yisrael would emerge and that the seed of a great nation will sprout forth from this particular child? That doesn't make any sense. So Avraham had a hundred reasons not to listen to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's command. But he, pray, he placed all his reasons aside and he followed Hashem's directive. At that moment when he placed Yitzhak on the Mizbeach, the Mizbeach, he rectified part of Adam's sin. How? Because Adam felt that you could break the law in order to keep the law. But Abraham said, you can't choose to do whatever you want to do with God's directives. A law is a law, and I cannot come along and change God's command because I think that there's a better way. Perhaps that's why the Pasuk in our parasha informs us that Avraham arranged the wood and bound Yitzhak his son. And then what does the Pasuk say? Vayasemoto al hamizbeach. And he placed them upon the altar. Mimaal la etzim. On top of the wood. Now I never understood this. Isn't it obvious that he put Yitzhak mimaal la etzim on top of the wood? If the Pasuk is telling me that Avraham put the wood on the Mizbeach, on the altar, where else would he put Yitzhak? Underneath the wood? I mean, why would he place him under the wood? Why doesn't the Pasuk read, Vayasem oto ala Mizbeach, and he placed Yitzhak upon the altar, and that's it. Why add the words, Mimaal la etzim, on top of the wood? Never understood this. But Chachamim tell us, and they ask a question, is it possible that the word etzim refers to the wood in Gan Eden? Which wood? The wood that emanated from the etzadat, from the tree of knowledge. Ah. Oh. So at the Akedah, Avraham places Yitzhak above the etzim. Which means that he was now involved in making a tikkun. He was involved in a global rectification. He was elevating the world to become mimaal, above the wood. That means that he was attempting to correct the sin of Adam who ate from the etzadat. And he did his part in rectifying Adam's sin through his utter devotion and obedience to Hashem under any and all circumstances without questioning his ways or making his own calculations or drawing his own conclusions. You see, Adam Arishon was involved in what we would call uh, an avera lishma, a sin for the sake of heaven. He chose to disobey God thinking that he was breaking the law with good intent. But Avraham Avinu, however, said, Whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu commands, I obey. I'm not going to be the one to outsmart God's law. Nobody is above the law to pick and choose what they wish to ignore, or what they're going to change, what they're going to revise or reform, even if they think it's Lishma, for the sake of heaven. So even if I think I know better, I don't know better. Often we think, yeah, Hashem commanded me to do this, but what about my concerns? What about all of my opinions? What about what I feel is best for me? Avam teaches us, that's not for us to decide, because it's a Kadosh Baruch Hu who's running the show. God knows exactly why things have to happen the way they do, because there are 
spiritual benefits taking place that may ultimately be the best for us and not just for us, for the entire world. I'll give you an example. Harav Menachem Menashe Alav Shalom in his Sefer Ahavat Chaim points out in this week's parasha that the Zohar Kadosh states that Yitzhak was born with a female soul. He possessed the neshama of a nekeva. Don't ask me what that means exactly right now, and there's no way, by the way, that you could uh, know just by looking at somebody if they possess a female or male soul. That's something that should be left to the spiritual realm. But the Zohar Kadosh does inform us of a heaven re heavenly rule that affects every person in this world. If a man possesses a female neshama, he will not be able to produce children. A male body needs a male soul, and a female body needs a female soul in order to reproduce. Just like you need a physical male and a physical female to produce a child, in the world of souls it's the same. In order to produce another neshama, there has to be a fusion of a female soul and a male soul. For whatever reason, reason which is not for us in this shiur today, Yitzchak possessed a female neshama. Now, Avraham placed him on the Mizbeach, and according to the Zohar Kadosh, Avraham Avinu really did slaughter Yitzchak to a degree because he made a small incision on his neck. At that moment, says the Zohar Kadosh, Yitzchak died momentarily, and his female soul was removed from him. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu replaced the female neshama with a male neshama. Once that switch of neshamot was made at the time of the Akedah, Yitzchak was able to produce children. Incidentally, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took the female soul that Yitzchak once possessed and he placed it into the ram that Avraham Avinu eventually placed on the Mizbeach and slaughtered and brought up as an offering. Chachamim teaches that that ram was created during the six days of creation. This was a 2,000 year old ram. Have you ever heard of a, a ram that's 2,000 years old? It's impossible for a ram to live for 2,000 years. So what does this all mean? It means that in spirit the ram was there. But when did it really take on a life of its own? when Hashem took Yitzchak's female neshama and placed it into that ram. And that means that when Avraham sacrificed that ram, who did he actually sacrifice? Yitzchak. That's why the Gemara of Zvachim refers to the ashes of that ram that were left after it was sacrificed and burnt as Afaro shel Yitzchak, the ashes of Yitzchak. What ashes of Yitzchak? Yitzchak was not burnt. But technically, he was sacrificed because his female soul was in that ram that was placed on the Mizbeach. So even the burning of the ram had significance. Why am I telling you this? What gave Yitzchak the ability to have children? What gave Avraham the ability to be the father of such a great nation? Akedat Yitzchak. Imagine if Avram would have said, you know, I thought about it, and, and, and why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I'm not going to go through with Akedat, and that's it. I'm not going to sacrifice my son. Imagine if he wouldn't have followed God's directives. Dora Chaim HaKadosh, Alav HaShalom, in his Sefer Or Gedaliah, who teaches us that that's why the birth of Rivka Yitzchak's future wife is mentioned immediately after the Akedah. Because now that Yitzchak was fit to have children, his soulmate was born. Wow. What do we learn from this? Initially, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded Avram to take his beloved son Yitzchak and offer him up as an Ola, Avram may have thought that the Akedah of Yitzchak 
would now nullify the promise of Hashem that his descendants would come through Yitzchak. He may have been afraid that there would no longer be a, con a continuation of Am Yisrael. But it was just the opposite. The Akedah was specifically what allowed Yitzchak to become fit to have children. That's what allowed the fulfillment of God's promise to Avraham to come to fruition. And that means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu truly knows best. If we follow His commands and obey His edicts, our destiny can manifest. But the problem is that we shouldn't make our own calculations of what we think is best. That's when the problems begin. Only Hashem knows what our future is going to look like. And Avraham stood firm and up to the test. In those moments of great faith and endurance, Am Yisrael was born. Life is full of spiritual obstacles and heavenly tests that elevate us to our designated purpose. And we have to trust that there's a destiny that's being created as though those challenges of life are being accepted and overcome. So let's discuss the subject of Nisyonot. Life's tests. Are there different kinds of tests? What's the purpose of a Nisayon? Is everybody tested? Should we view a Nisayon as a positive or negative item of life? A Nisayonot absolutely necessary for our growth and development? Is it true that we're always capable of overcoming whatever comes our way? What exactly does it mean to pass a heavenly test? And how can we succeed when we're faced with a Nisayon? Our parasha depicts the classical examples of Nisyonot in the Torah, which were the ten tests that Avraham Avinu went through. In fact, they're what transformed him from Avram, the child of an idolater, into Avraham, the father of the Jewish people. Rabbeinu Bachya, alav shalom, discusses this idea, and he quotes the pasuk in Sefer Bereshit that says, "Veha Elokim nisa et Avraham," and God tested Avraham. Even though the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot tells us that Avraham was tested with ten tests, only the Akeda is explicitly referred to in the Torah as a nisayon, as a test. And that's because it was the greatest of all the tests. And that makes perfect sense because Chachamim teach us, when Hashem wants to test you with a big nisayon, He's not going to clobber you over the head with that test straight off the bat. Hashem initially, initially tests you with small tests, in order to accustom you to, and to strengthen you that you should be able to stand up to tests in general and then graduate to more difficult tests as your life progresses. As you continue to face one challenge after the next, you begin to develop the strength to stand up then to a big test. And when you overcome the Nisayon, that's where the greatness of your love for Hashem is revealed. The Maharal of Prague, Alav Shalom, in his Sefer Derech Haim, writes that Hashem tested Avraham with ten nisyonot in order that he be tested with every type of nisayon in the world. He wanted Avraham to understand that in life there are going to be many kinds of challenges that a person is going to face. Some will be less challenging, some will seem impossible to overcome. And each test, from the kindergarten type tests, through the elementary school type tests, stretching through the high school type tests, are not the same challenges that we're going to face when we move up to university type tests. God is kind and merciful in that way. He knows that Nisyonot have to increase in levels of difficulty as we, pro we progress through life so that by the time we become adults, 
we're spiritually strengthened and ready to handle whatever comes our way. And, and we're able to handle it with faith and fortitude. And the Malbim al Shalom explains that the main point of an Isayon is exactly this, to develop not only your character and, and, and strength, but also your Ahavat Hashem, the love for God. The Nisayon is meant to create a love for God that grows within a person's heart to the point that all other loves you have are nullified to the love that you feel for Hashem. That means that whatever or whoever you love the most can be sacrificed and dedicated because of the love you feel for Hashem. That's exactly what the Akedah expressed. Think about Avram for a moment. Think about him for a moment. He came to recognize his creator through philosophical thought and analysis. But is that enough? Just to think about Hashem and think about his presence in the world? No. Hashem wanted Avam to attain a level of emunah shlema, of complete faith. A faith that's independent of his intellectual understanding. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted Avam to simply follow his will in all circumstances of life, even if it meant overriding his own thoughts, analysis, and exploration. Therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tested him with ten nisyonot to determine whether he'd question how God dealt with him. That's something that the Midrash Shmuel, Allah Shalom, explains. He writes that the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot states, Asara nisyonot nitnasa Avraham Avinu. With ten tests, our forefather Avraham was tested. Ve'amad bekulam. And he withstood them all. Ladies, the nature of a person is to be pained when he experiences Yisurim, when, he, when he's faced with agonizing challenges. And that includes, by the way, Tzadikim Gmurim, completely righteous individuals. Therefore, the Mishnah here is telling us that even when Avraham was being tested with these ten tests, he stood up to all of them fully and with a great love for God. He didn't feel that the, the difficulty of the test is not going to pull him down, but rather that this test is meant to establish his stature. Avraham felt that he was actually emotionally settled with these challenges, that it helped him to reach great levels of spirituality. That's why when the Torah Kedusha tells us in our parasha that Avraham Avinu got up early in order to fulfill God's command to sacrifice Yitzchak, it's in these words that we're being taught about his remarkable enthusiasm. Even at the age of 137, which is when the Akedah took place. In fact, that was the main accomplishment of Avraham. The main nisayon of the Akedah was not whether or not he was going to bring Yitzchak up as an offering, because we know that he wasn't planning on disobeying Hashem. Rather, the test was, and at the end what he overcame was, Avram didn't just obey Hashem's command. He did it with great joy and enthusiasm. So our Chachamim learned from the words in the Torah that the person who shows excitement the person who has vigor rushes to do the mitzvot. Nothing expresses simcha as much as zrizut, as much as enthusiasm for the mitzvot. That's one of the important lessons we learned from the Akedah. The Akedah made us aware of just how far the love and fear of Hashem extends itself. I want you to think about that. This command by Hashem concerning Avraham's own child was beyond human comprehension, was beyond any comparison. Because, it, think about it, more than giving away his money, or even his own life, it was greater than anything else which could possibly happen to Avraham or what the nature of a person could ever imagine. To sacrifice your own son. 
But there was a purpose behind God's command to Avraham. The Ramchal Alav Shalom in his Sefer Deretz Etz Chaim explains that greatness doesn't happen through randomness. Greatness happens through cause and determination. When we see the, the stature of the giants of our nation, the holy Avot, our holy forefathers, we understand that there's a path and there's a pro an approach to building oneself. What's the path? With one Nisayon after another, greatness after greatness emerges. Because the power of greatness and actualization surfaces as a result of the challenges of life. Not that you don't have any ups and downs in your life. Not that you have a smooth road and no obstacles or complexities. That's not what life is truly about. So perhaps now we can understand the great wonder that the entire world is amazed by. Everybody in the world wants to know how it's possible that despite all the challenges and difficulties that came upon the Jewish nation throughout all the years, thousands of years of exile, how is it possible that we still exist and we're still standing? You know why we're still standing? Because the actions of our forefathers are the roots and the tree that we grew from. We derived nourishment, life, and existence from the strong roots of our holy Avot all throughout the Galut. All the winds of the world and all the anti-Semitism and hatred that's hurled against us is not going to cause us to move from our place because our roots are strong. Our roots cannot be moved. Because we're a nation whose forefathers held, held firm to the will of God and to His commands and to the letters of the Holy Torah. And they instilled in us the strength to be able to, to withstand the test of time. Our Nisyonot throughout the various exiles gave us the ability to build us from inside. The Nisyonot of Avam Avinu were for the sake of creating and building his stature and his wholesomeness. It began with him and it ends with us. There's no doubt that, that there was an order to those tests, just like there's an order to every structure. But only because of all those tests together did he achieve his perfection. And we're certain that if Avam Avinu would not have stood up to this final test, not only would he be missing that final step, but his entire process of perfection would have been lacking. And that means that even the earlier tests that he overcame would have been lost to him. That's something that the Tosfot Yom Tov Alav Shalom points out in his Mishnayot Masifta. He writes, that the reason why Avraham is called Avraham Avinu, Avraham our father, is because all the future generations that emerged from him merited and received a great benefit as a result of him standing up to all the nisyonot, to all the challenges. Ladies, we're not a nation that cries out in anger again and again. We're not a nation who violently protests against anti-Semitism. We're not a nation who riots viciously. We don't use the political stage as a means of achieving our God-given rights. We don't hurl accusation and use the race card as a means to create balance. We rise to the occasion through actions, through faith, through living the life that we're meant to live. We don't spend our time complaining or creating a huge stir on the streets and in the media. We simply continue to live and to achieve and we rise through our endeavors and through our accomplishments. You know why? Because we're a nation who's future-oriented. 
We proceed into the future with great hope. And we don't need the entire world to validate our existence. We have God who confirmed our presence in the world and He's the one who's been supporting us and He's the one who's been guiding us throughout this entire period of the Galut and throughout all the turmoil. So when Avraham chose to obey God's command to sacrifice his son, that act of faith and solid belief in God was passed on to the Jewish people. That act was the continued existence of the heart and soul of our nation and its spiritual benefit. If Avraham would, would, would not have believed in the existence of a, of a spiritual sahar, in the rewards that await him in Olam Haba, in the world to come, he would have never been able to pass that test. The Midrash Shmuel Shalom explains that every occurrence in life that's difficult and painful for us, it's called a Nisayon. A Nisayon tests and evaluates us in terms of which level of perfection and wholesomeness are we going to be able to attain in our Avodat Hashem, in our service to God? That's why the Midrash Tan Choma addresses the obvious question regarding Nisyonot. At that time, Avam asked God, he said, A person can test his friend when he doesn't really know what's in his friend's heart or when he suspects his friend of being not so genuine, not so real, when he suspects that his friend is a two-facer, when he suspects that his friend has not been his friend all along, then he tests his friend again and again to determine his true wholesomeness. But you, Hashem, you do know what's inside the heart and even the kidneys of man. So why do you need to test me with this Nisayon? Don't you know my heart? That was the question of Avam Avinu to Hashem. And the Malbim answers that there's a, dis there's, there's a distinction between a Nisayon and something that's called a Bechina. A Bechina is an evaluation of what is in terms of the nature of something. For example, you could evaluate gold to determine whether the gold is real or fake. That's a bechina. You're mafchin the gold. But a nisayon is testing whether there's some potential which isn't presently known to you. For example, is a person completely dedicate, dedicated to Hashem and would he stand up in righteousness beyond the nature of most people? That means that a Nisayon has no limits. Avaham was tested with 10 tests and each one was greater than the previous one. In that context, the meaning of a Nisayon isn't something that's simply uh, hard for you to do because you assume you were created to do easy things. No. In Sefer Yov, Yov tells us quite clearly that Adam le Amal Yulad, a person was born to toil. We were not born into this world to sit back, relax, and take it easy. A person who likes easy things, a person who admires the smooth road, a person who would rather have a life without ups and downs, a life free of complexities. You know what Chachamim say about such a person? He's inwardly a weak, lazy, or rebellious person. And they call him lazy because the goal of a person in life is avodah, service, and amelut, toiling. Chachamim point out that a person, think of it this way, can put a lot of effort into matters of gashmiut, into matters of materialism, which he generally desires. And somehow he never grows tired of it. You can plan a vacation and put a lot of effort into it and pack your suitcases in detail and spend hours and even days looking for a ticket to go somewhere. 
You put so much effort into your trip and where you're going to go and what you're going to do. If that person would make the same effort in the areas of ruhaniyut, of spirituality, he'd also work hard to achieve spiritual elevation without feeling that it was so hard for him. So the amelut, the toiling for spiritual growth, that's not considered a nisayon. That's something that's natural because that's what we were created for. It just requires us to make a decision on our part. Working hard in order to grow spiritually, ladies, is not considered a nisayon in and of itself. Rather, a nisayon is something that goes against the teva, against the nature of a person. For example, think of the nisayonot that our avot experienced. Their nisayonot, even according to the simple perspective of the world, were against the nature of the entire creation. Is it natural for a father to sacrifice his son? No. When a person is willing to sacrifice, even if it means going against the very nature of creation, that demonstrates the greatest love that a person can feel for his creator. The Maharal of Prague in his Sefer Tiferet Yisrael writes that the expression of love towards anything or anyone, but especially Hashem, is when we can stand up to very difficult tests. But more than this, the word nisayon comes from the word nasot, which means to make great. That's what the Pasuk in Sefer Shemot states concerning the purpose of Matan Torah. What does the Pasuk tell us over there? Vayomer Hashem el ha'am, and Moshe told the nation, Al tira'u, do not fear. Ki leva'avur nasot etchem baha elokim, because God has come in order to exalt you. A nisayon is meant to elevate us to a higher spiritual plane, to raise us beyond our own expectations, to lift us towards our own spiritual purpose. I'll end with this thought. Each of us has been bestowed with many talents and many strengths, but all too often we don't always actualize those strengths and talents. When we face challenges, however, we're able to rise above averageness and we realize our enormous potential. Every nisayon can extract the very best from us. The Ramban Shalom writes that the purpose of a nisayon is to take something from the place of potential to the world of reality. Challenges are a divine communication that let us know exactly what we're capable of and how much we're capable of, how much more. A nisayon prompts us to make our very best efforts and to bring to life the full extent of our abilities. Challenges also teach us that this strength we never knew existed can be tapped into even during times that are not so difficult. You know what that means? It means that any pain that we experience from a nisayon is actually a call to action. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't just want us to get by. He wants us to strive to reach greater spiritual heights. That's what Avraham taught us. Avraham Avinu, the first of our forefathers, faced ten very particular tests. And they were, one test had a certain a percentage of difficulty and it exceeded more and more. It was an incline of nisyonot. So with each nisayon, Avraham was tapping deeper into the reservoirs of his soul. That's something we learn already from the first test that he was charged with. From the very first command to Avraham Avinu by Hashem. Where Hashem tells, us, tells him in last week's parasha, Lech Lecha, which is usually translated as go for yourself. But Chachamim say that we could actually read it as Lech Lecha. Go to yourself. Access your innermost self. Avraham's tests were a journey deep into his neshama to discover what he was truly capable of. 
The tests he experienced and overcame demanded more strength or abilities that, 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 that he thought he never had. But through the Nisayon itself, he discovered that he does have the ability to go beyond the limits of his rational mind. The word Ness, which means a miracle, are the first two letters of the word Nisayon. Tests and miracles are closely connected because a Ness, a miracle, is when God breaks out of his standard pattern of natural law and demonstrates unlimited powers. And a Nisayon, a test, is when Hashem invites you to do the same. As human beings, we cannot escape the fact that we are going to be faced with external and internal Nisayonot. These conditions pose a big challenge to our moral and spiritual development. But our biggest challenge and struggle is also our biggest asset. Because when we overcome challenges through our hard work, our triumph introduces us to a new and higher level of existence. And in that place of victory, that's where we can experience miracles. Hiratzon. We should be zaychet to live up to the standards of Avraham Avinu and overcome life challenges with great strength and fortitude. May we utilize our ultimate potential and rise to the occasion so that we can elevate our spirit, become stronger from inside and be role models of faith and endurance. May each Nisayon raise us higher and higher on the ladder of spirituality and bring us closer to God, closer to our essence, and bring with it miracles and blessings. Bekarov, Amen Ken, Yehi